Haul the roll and go. Where am I to go, me Johnny? Where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go? Hello, and welcome to Where Am I to Go? Today we're on Pier 39 in Astoria, Oregon, and there used to be a bumblebee, cannery. is that correct? Bam bumblebee cannery here yeah. where they canned tuna. Yeah, it was mostly a refrigerated storage, however, in the later, that as the industry got developed, they, they built a bigger cannery down the road near the, near the, the, the interstate bridge there. Okay, and we are with Peter, yeah. and Peter is going to be our guide today. He's yeah. agreed to kind of give us a tour yeah. through here. Yeah. And so let's go for a walk, Peter, and see what, what all's here on Pier 39. All right. All right. Well, it's kind of obvious when you walk in here that this is not your average everyday building. It's, I wonder if most people actually cotton onto it before they find the sign that says freezer room, or they observe the sign that says freezer room, refrigerated, storage, ice cold, because we're in a refrigerator. That's why the walls are a foot thick. That's why the doors look like they're vaults of a bank there. And they're huge. They're, yeah, they're what, yeah. probably six foot by yeah, eight yeah. foot doors? Oh, they're that size so that you could drive a forklift truck through them. Okay. you didn't want to hang around in here because it was so cold. Like, like South Pole in winter, that's what all industrial freezers are. They're not just freezing like the refrigerator. Right. They are way, way below zero. Okay. So... Yeah. And this all has wood floors, so yeah, they were driving the forklifts yeah. on a wood floor. Oh, yeah. And uh, the only insulation they had, which is a secret here, after what's the insulation? It's sawdust, and it spills through cracked planks sometimes, falls through a hole in the ceiling. And how thick did you say the walls were? About a foot thick? Yeah. You can, you can look, you can measure there. Uh, thicker over here, but it's sawdust. And let me tell you, if you want to move a plank... You're going to you're up, you're up to your knees in sawdust before you know it. It just comes down like an avalanche there. And, and, was, and the sawdust was fairly plentiful because you had yeah, lots of yeah. uh, sawmills yeah. around here because of the, the massive logging, amounts of the wood logging, and, and the yeah. logging here it on the Oregon coast. It tended to be coast. cedar dust because there was a cedar mill, and cedar is, a, is better preserved. You know, It has certain chemical properties, so it doesn't get... Um, grungy, like right, like a fur. Well, the reason they use it in cedar chests and right, cedar right. cabinets and, yeah, yeah. and that type of stuff. Yes. So it, so it's all wood, and uh, if you look overhead, um, you won't see many pipes anymore. You'll see a few rusty pipes, but uh, look. This is what I say to people: look behind your refrigerator. What do you see? You see pipes. Right. You see pipes. Well, that's how refrigeration works. It works the same in an industrial strength place. Only the pipes. You can hardly get your hand around them, and they're, and they're like a radiator, okay, like a car radiator. Car radiator takes heat out of your car, okay. Refrigerator takes heat out of your food and spreads it through the pipes. So the same thing here. We had to cut them down because they were ugly as hell. Right. They were dripping rust on people, and they were weighing the building down. Yeah. And, and yeah. what did they use for the refrigeration? Was it a Freon or was it no, uh, no, no, no. ammonia? That's right. It That's was right. ammonia, okay. And you know, if we, will get, if we get there, you'll see I put up little signs that were all around. Basically, they're warning signs in yellow. And most people don't recognize that. It's a little test. To see, can you, <laughs> do you know what ammonia was for originally? And you, if you've got a sniff inside some of these pipes, you'd still smell ammonia there. Yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. So... Um, so this was freezing, completely freezing. So you took a breath once you came through those doors. You, the bells rang, you opened the door, you zoomed in with your forklift, jumped off. You put fish in or you took fish out and then you got the heck out of there. And you, people wore sleeping bags. I've been in a modern one. I mean, they are dressed like you wouldn't believe it. And and, so how cold are we talking? Well, below, below zero? zero 20 yeah. below zero? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like yeah. There's an official number somewhere there. Kind of like Wyoming winters. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go, there you go. <laughs> so, and in the first um, freezer room here, which has a name, the E1, um, this, this is uh, actually kind of a subdivision of the whole, the whole space here, the whole block. And so this was, uh, this was to divide up the fish into years and seasons and different kinds of fish. And it was mostly tuna. It wasn't salmon because salmon was the premium fish. Salmon had to be canned fresh. 
That was what the housewives of America were told and they, what they demanded that. And it just so happened they discovered tuna, literally, according to our, our uh, instructional film from the 1960s, they, did, well, they found it in the 1930s. And what's this big fish swimming around off the coast? Well, let's take it back and see if anybody wants to buy it, you know. And, that, and it was just invented like that. So the tuna, unfortunately for the tuna, um, has the, um, <clears throat> the capacity to be frozen and to taste pretty good when you thaw it out. Okay. Comes, comes back pretty much the same as it went in, like chicken. But you understand, fit, well, many things don't freeze. Well, <laughs> right, you know? right. And salmon's one of them. Salmon's got that... It, or if you can flash freeze it like they do in modern times, then that's pretty good. But in the old days, you slowly cooked it down again, you slowly, and you slowly thawed it up. It, it spoiled. And, and anyway, the idea was it's going to be fresh, we're going to can it fresh, and, and that's great advertising, it's great marketing, and so um, may, maybe uh, some salmon was okay frozen, but that was not what they had been... So this, was, so this yeah, was for yeah. mostly tuna? Yeah, this is all for tuna. I didn't think Oregon was a big tuna fishery. It's 50 to 100 miles out there. And it, okay. And, and um, it comes and goes. And yeah, the tropics is where tuna live all the time. But when, when the currents change, you know, the, the, um, the El Nino brings right. fish and different fish come up the coast. There's um, anchovies come up the coast. That's why we've seen whales in the river out here eating anchovies. And I saw, I've been on a boat that was catching anchovies, 100 tons at a time there. Wow. So you learn a little bit about the outside world of fishing, but it's pretty delineated is that this industry was positioned here to catch the fish swimming up the river to spawn and die. And that was the salmon. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't need to go outside the river. I mean, um, the fishermen who went outside the river were doing other kinds of fishing mostly in the... And the bar was such a fearsome thing, still is a pretty fearsome thing, that um, the only reason salmon fishermen go outside is to try and get first bite of the fish because it's so competitive now and there's very few fish left. But otherwise, you fished when the tide, you fished when the tide was coming in, but you went up and down the river with the tide every six hours, and fishermen knew what they had to do on each kind of tide, where the sandbanks shoaled up where the fish would wait the fish i hear them say to me so oh yeah the fish would wait in the bay over there until the tide came in they'd come in on one side they'd take a rest they've been swimming a long time you know and they've got a long way to go they're going hundreds of miles up the columbia and so all the way up the columbia there are different villages different cultures who know what the fish do when they're coming through here and it's father the son you tell your children how to the secrets the family secrets right to catch the fish now, so now you talked right. about the Columbia Bar, yeah, and people aren't going to really understand uh, what yeah, that yeah. is. So let's kind of oh, talk okay. a little bit more about it. The Columbia Bar, you've got the yeah. Columbia River that goes yeah, out yeah. into the ocean, and yeah. and in the old days there was a big sandbar out there. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. And, and it just kind of meandered out into yeah. the ocean. Um, whereas they ended up building jetties yeah. out, and then the jetties are amazing public works. They look as if they're going to Japan, you know, they disappear into the distance. I mean, they go miles. out, what, five miles? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a highway being built, at a, a bumpy highway, but it's a highway just that just goes to nowhere, and it takes huge amounts of effort. And every few years they say, this time we're going to do it right, this time we're going to position the rocks just so, with this corner, and, and we're going to tell the crane driver, don't drop that rock until it fits just so if it doesn't fit put it back get another one wow so, so it's, it's like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle and that's what the core the core will come along and check that you're doing it because otherwise the rocks just roll off the first storm they start to roll down to the seabed and then they just sink into the sand <laughs> so are they still building the jetty they, they never stop because, they never because it's constantly sinking, sinking of just being washed off and yeah it never stops. It never will stop. There is no solution. And they also have dredge boats going yeah. in and out all the yeah. time, picking the sand that's, out that's so, right. that, so that you've yeah. got a channel for the they are ships to come in. They are, sucking the sand up a giant tube. Okay. Yeah. And uh, like 30-inch wide tube with a big screw in it, sucking the sand up. Like okay. a vacuum cleaner. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
and, and, and the bar is effect. really treacherous yeah. because you've got the water going out from the river and the water in the currents of the ocean. Is that is that no, what causes the, the treacherousness? You've got or? the waves, the waves and the wind coming in, and you've got the current going out there. Okay. And that, that, that's, those, those are pretty equal, you know. The current can pick up, at, at the height, the current could be going 10 miles an hour for a little while, and then it starts to slow down. But during that time, it, it, it starts to create breakers going out we think of breakers as coming in from right. the ocean oh well what happens is the current coming down turns a very kind of smooth um what should we say easy swell suddenly becomes a surfing wave okay and, and like magically because i've I, now i've sailed a little boat across the bar and you choose the right time nothing nothing it's like a mill pond and you go there go get three hours later and you life and death you know, this suddenly comes on. So most of the thing is, is people are too impatient to get back in, and and that means fishermen want to go home. I mean, sports fishermen want to go home. But commercial fishermen, that means they've been out for three weeks. They're sick and tired of this. Damn it, we're not waiting out all night. Or if there's a bad storm, it, it's it's bad no matter what the current's doing. And the coast guard says you've got to wait. <laughs> it's going round in circles. But big ocean-going ships do literally steam in circles during a winter storm. You can look at them online, um, shipposition.com or something like that, and you'll see a circle of boats going round and round, <laughs> waiting, really? for the, waiting for the wind to stop howling. Yeah, yeah. But so, there's a lot of shipwrecks at the, yeah, at the yeah. mouth of the Columbia. Yeah. And those were mostly sailing ships, but steamships too. But they've kind of got it figured out now. They've got satellite navigation. That's right. the most important thing. They've got good radios. And they have to do what they're told, or you pull their license. You see these people. So, um, not so many. I would say the only thing that has the danger of old timey is the crab fishermen who, who want to get the crab in for Christmas or New Year's. And of course, that's, that's when the crab is prime, and that's unfortunately the worst time of the year to be fishing out there. And not only that, but you have to pull the crab pots off the bottom, bring them all the way up, look in the boat. The crab, we've got some crab pots around the corner, so we'll wait till we okay. get to there for that. So Sorry to have taken yeah, you down no, the rabbit hole of the no, bar, no. but it's one of those, it's oh, one of yeah. those very important yeah. things with life yeah. here that, yeah. uh, that maybe a um, lot of people wouldn't understand. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, we're in, the, we're in the cannery room here, where we've turned the first refrigerated room, and after some years of wondering whether I could do better, I suddenly, no one tapped me on the shoulder, I wish they had, I'd suddenly realized, you got, you got, you got a muddle in here, you just put nice, you've got one thing showing on the screen and you've got one thing on your right hand side, you've got another thing on the wall. So I cleaned it all up so that everything in here says tannery. Right? Okay. So what you're watching on, on the video screen is reflected on the walls, it's reflected on the equipment. And some of this equipment, this is not like your average museum, it takes a, 10 strong men and a forklift truck and levers and rollers to get these machines in and they, oh, we can't move them anymore. We don't wow. have those guys. We're all getting too old to move that stuff, you know. I mean, this this machine here. I mean, come on, it's just there's no moving it. And it's, what was this machine for? So, this was so for. So this is it in action. So the banners. This is my my design style now. The banners on the wall are photographs of ladies working on the machine that you can touch in front of you, and you can look up and you can see what they were doing. They were putting, they were putting fish fillets. They were putting and... the fish into the machine which magically you didn't have to think too hard you left a bit of space and the machine squished them down until they were the can size okay and then pop pop them into the can okay and we're looking at a machine here that's probably 10 foot long yeah that has lots of levers and yeah. or, or uh, handles on yeah. it and lots of gears and lots of chains yeah and we've got these bowls that the ladies are, are putting the fish into uh -huh, and, uh -huh. and then they have a way to compress uh -huh. the fish down to can size yeah, and, it, yeah. and it would be the can size of like a normal yeah. can of, yeah. of tuna that you get in yeah. the store. And um, let's see, and in fact if you watch the video long enough you're seeing the cannery ladies, you're seeing the fish sorters, you're seeing the mechanics who keep everything running, you meet the man, Mr. Carruthers, who not just built it, he invented it. It came out of his imagination. These wow. Things do. He was like... And the, that was right here in Astoria? Hey, I've never said this before. He was like the Thomas Edison of fish processing, right? Well, yeah. 
that's yeah. that's cool. So they yeah. were using his equipment yeah. all across the the Northwest yeah. into Alaska and yeah. and everywhere else because yeah. of the efficiency. I mean, he of patented his ideas, right? And uh, we uh, he had a factory um, a few miles downriver from here, which I saw when I first came in twenty years ago. We're still putting out these machines and incorporating computer control and electronic eyes and quality assessment um, software in there. And now he's been bought out by a Midwestern company. At least it's not a Japanese company, you know. Right. And they're a Midwestern food company. They don't. They can corn, you know, on vegetables. Right. But they thought they'd like. They like that. I think there must have been something they liked that they really wanted, like a pattern. You know, right. That they wanted to get hold of, because I don't think they. Well, there aren't any fish in the Midwest. Right. So, well. So yeah. And that, and that. Well, they they took everything. They didn't leave a branch here. So. I figure they wanted some know-how or the, um, who knows. Okay. Who knows? You can decide for yourself looking at these wonderful machines though. And there's an old generation one and there's a sample of some new generation thinking there that, that the guys left me when they shut down the company, like the last day, they said, Pete, come in at four o'clock and we'll put it out the back and you can take it away and don't tell anybody there. You know, so now I'm not telling anybody. There. Right, 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 right. Yeah. But this room is really cool. Yeah, like he yeah. said, he's got several machines in here. He's got cans that are yeah. in different stages of being canned. He's got banners on the side telling, showing pictures of the ladies doing their thing and talking about the machines. He's got a, a video that is very in-depth showing exactly how the whole canning process worked. And this is a nice little uh, display and, and demonstration yeah. of, of how things worked. Yeah. You'll find people like yourself, people who've realized, hey, honey, sit down. We're going to watch this. Or, yeah. or the wife says, sit down. My mom used to do this. Pay attention. Or the kids sit down and the mom says, this is where your tuna fish comes from. Now pay attention. And people do. Yeah. And you come there and not a word, not a word. Yeah, we watched the, the video yeah. in the other yeah. room here earlier yeah. today and we sat there for about an hour. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. How, it's, it's close to 45 yeah. minutes yeah. or something. Yeah. And it was very interesting and talked yeah. about gill netting yeah. and, and the fishing process. So out here in the corridor, which is still frozen, but the corridor between the smaller uh, freezer rooms, we got plans of uh, local fishing boats, which were all kind of, they were evolutionary designs there's no architect on any of these okay the guys just figured it out and one shop built it slightly different from another shop and and then they they kept the plans they kept the molds which they're called you know the mold, right the right. mold shape is and and um they built wooden boats here up until the 1960s and the um traditionally the cannery built its own boats it was kind of, um, let's just say, it was a monopolistic practice where the cannery built the boats and rented the boats to the fishermen, then they loaned the nets to the fishermen, and then the fishermen was actually, had to come to the company store, you know. Right. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the same, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they worked really hard and yeah, didn't really make a lot. Right. They made, you know, five cents a pound, that kind of thing there. And so the second room we come into, same shape as the first one, so it's, um, let me see, it's 30 feet long and 10 feet wide, something like that. And this is pure fishing now. So we've got fishing on the walls, we've got fishing on the floor, and we've got the fishing movie showing. And when he's talking about fishing, he's, yeah. got, he's got the nets, he's yeah. got repair things for the yeah. gill nets. Yeah. Yeah. He's got pictures of uh, the fishermen catching fish and, and the way that they were living, the boats that they had. Uh, he's got all kinds of floats for the, for the gill nets. Yeah. And the video was extremely interesting. We did watch that for, yeah. like I said, about 45 minutes. He's got an old safe in here. And this is just a, a really nice room showing how the operation went as far as yeah. the fishing end of it. They got organized, the fishermen. Eventually here they unionized and they fought back against the cannery. They started their own cannery, which was a tremendously brave thing to do in 1896 or something. You know? Right. That's because they had, they were Scandinavians. They, the, the leaders were Scandinavians and Finns who had uh, a very strong political ethic going there. You know? Okay. I mean, seriously, seriously strong. And um, I mean, they believed in, in a, um, uh, a cooperative mode um, which is only what the cannery operators were doing because they got together and, and cooperated and, and refused to bid against each other. So the fishermen were only playing fair, you know. Yeah, I mean, so this cannery, 
they, this group of, of very wealthy men were getting rich off these amazing salmon runs, and so they formed a combine, um, the CRPA. The so they started up their own organization. Yeah, and around the corner here we've got a special um, a dedicated spot for the crab, which is the most graphic thing in the museum. Kids love it. And that's why it says do not touch there, but you can touch everything else. We've got a giant crab from Alaska, the kind of crab that you see on the Deadliest Catch TV show. And we've got the local crabs, which are much smaller, but still tasty and just as dangerous to catch. And our local crab pots are uh, much smaller than the Alaska crab pots. But as a matter of fact, they are harder and more dangerous because you're expected to pick those up and stack them on a rolling fish boat. And um, no help, no, no crane, no nothing there. And so you got to um, pull them all up by yeah, hand. Well, still, no, you're not pulling them up by hand. You're stacking them by hand and you're moving them around the deck by hand. Whereas okay. These guys on the deadliest catch, they're using a crane there. The right. crane does all the work. It's impossible to move that without the crane. But you can just about move these if you're big and strong. And when you're too old to do that, you become the captain and you get some young men to do it because it's tough, tough work. Tough work. And now these crab pots, yeah, they're, yeah. they're about, what, three foot in diameter, yeah, yeah. And about 12 Four. inches thick. Yeah. They, they throw a fish in there. They throw s some dead meat of some kind. They all got their idea what the best bait is. And then the crabs only have yeah, one yeah, way yeah. in or two ways yeah. in, but it traps yeah, behind sure. them. And then they're able to bring yeah, this yeah. up. And then so you uh, can put your hand in there, simple, simple enough, and then you, can, then you can see where the crab can't get out again. Because right. The, 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 the prongs. The, the prongs come yeah, down and, yeah, and block yeah. the, and trap yeah. the door. And so you end up yeah. with a bunch of crabs yeah. in here, but the crabs have to be certain size. And, yeah. and male. Well, they have to be a male. So you throw all the females back there. If you're a crab fisherman, you know how to spot them, and you've got a, you have a gauge hanging off your belt, which gives you the six inch, so you don't guess. You right. Or you, every now and then you check that you, <laughs> that you memorize the shape. But it, I mean, it's a f an amazingly photogenic fishery because crabs are just such active and then there's the stack pots. So it's easy to get great photographs, as you can right. see. These are all calendar pages from the Fisherman's News calendar, by the way. And They're, now did they can crabs here also? Yeah, or? yeah, that's what these cans okay. are for. And, but it takes a lot of, a lot of crab and you've got to pick the meat out of the legs. You can't waste any. So, um, but that's the restaurant size and... Um, and they still use these, they use these uh, here on the pier. They do, they do crab um, sandwiches, you know, crab right. plates. And they use a can like that. Um, okay. One thing is it's pretty expensive to uh, buy a fresh crab. It's kind of a delicacy. Um, whereas the crab in the can is a little cheaper, you know. There. Really? And if you, yeah, even with yeah. all the processing yeah, and stuff. Yeah. And, and more importantly is that it's, it's quick. You can't be... If, you, if you're making a crab sandwich, someone's got to have picked that crab and emptied it, and you can't have your staff doing that, or they'll never get the job done. <laughs> so, um, but in, 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 um, in some of these processing plants, there's a line of people, mostly Spanish speaking, who are cracking crabs and picking all day long, getting good at it, you know, and they've got protective clothing on, they've got gloves on. That's why you can't have your waitress, you know, right. gloves on doing the crab and then coming out and serving it there. Right. And so oh. this is this is a much bigger yeah. room. This one yeah. here is probably twenty by yeah. thirty, and oh. you've got uh, you've got some nice displays of, yeah. of the different boxes yeah. of uh, of yeah. product that that was maybe done here. You've got uh, a can sealer, an, an old can sealer here that's that's set up, and a story about J O Hawthorne and Company. Hanthorn. Was he the Hanthorn? Hanthorn excuse yeah. me, is he the one yeah. that that started the? Yeah. And cannery you, here what you find is that all of these names they, they left their wife went the, the, fa the biggest family in town um, when he'd made his fortune and the old man had died the women all moved to San Francisco <laughs> they wanted to live in a big city but, wow. but otherwise the others um, this side of the river they wanted to move to Portland I mean you got money you cannot you can't show off your wealth in that story huh? there's just no roads to drive your car on there's no there's no theaters to wear your lovely clothes so you're, you're, you're in business, and same thing across the river, you've got to go to Olympia. Right. To, but now you're in the state capital, now you're, now you're cooking there. And you may leave, um, you may leave uh, your managers in charge, or you may sell the thing. 
as it got more industrially developed, the original guys, were, they made them an offer you couldn't refuse. You know, we'll take it over. We're going to make, we're going to go national with this, you know. Right. We're going to go international with this. We're going to sell it to England. And my mother served me John West salmon, the most famous salmon in the world. Trust me, it is in the English speaking world. And John West is buried 30 miles up river from here. He died in 1860 something there. And he named the town after him, as people tended to do. Right. And the, there's weeds growing over his grave. And yet his salmon brand is, is the, one of the biggest um, market, seafood marketing companies in the world now. Been sold on a few times there. Right. You know? So, yes. Yeah, so um, that lives on in all kinds of cultures in, all over the world. People know um, American salmon, Alaska salmon, Columbia River salmon was this... Um, but it, it, had, it was prestigious, you know. Right. You served your guests canned salmon sandwiches on a Sunday after church. Well, I didn't even know that there was a, a yeah. bunch of Atlantic salmon until yeah. probably yeah. five years ago. I thought all yeah. the salmon came from the yeah. Pacific Northwest. There you go. I couldn't spit it out. Columbia River Packers. <laughs> the Columbia River Packers Association is what yeah. the CRPA was. Yeah. yeah. We, we were having a, yeah. a brain hiccup here. So, oh, now he's got yeah, a big picture yeah, of uh, yeah, yeah. the freezer. Yeah, this yeah. is amazing. How yeah. many thousands of fish were yeah. in this freezer? I like to say they're stacked up like cordwood. Oh, right? man. Yeah. yeah. And, and this, this is actually probably another room because it's got square posts. It's probably the corner room over there. I mean, people didn't write on the back of the M photo what it was. I right. guess there. But, um, so that's got square columns in the corner with windows facing outwards now. But it didn't have windows, of course. Well, we're talking thousands oh, of yeah, fish yeah, here. Yeah. So, um, so the program was, was that um, the big cannery would, would start up for the, for, would decide, okay, we wrote, we're finished with salmon, we shut down the salmon line, we'll have that cleaned and oiled and ready for next year. Then they'd move over to where the tuna machinery was and they'd start tuna. And this is what they're going to can. And so wow. they would call down. They'd get up. They had a phone. You know, we were modern here. We had the first cable TV in the world here. Really? <laughs> and because um, couldn't get it any other way. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they'd call down and say, right, start them rolling. And these will be loaded on the trucks there. And we got pictures. And it's, it's, in the, it's in the video, too. And they will be loaded out there with the overhead crane. And then they trundle down the road for a mile. And then they'd bring them in, and then they would start the process. And now, were these fish cleaned before they were oh, frozen? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so they'd, yeah. they'd bring them in on the, sh yeah. on the boats, and then they'd go ahead and clean them, and then yeah. freeze them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that, so whatever happened down the road involved thawing them out first, cutting them up, and um, arranging where the meat was going to go, in which kind of form, and then cooking them. You know, giant retorts. And... Um, there were this, you rolled, you rolled um, big trailers or trolleys full of fish into retorts, and that's a kind of a retort there. But you walked in, the men walked in pushing huge trolleys loaded with fish, and then they load, loaded with cans as well, with the fish in the can, depending on which process they were using. So okay. it was uh, industrial cooking, industrial everything, you know, and, and that's why um, it took... I mean, a, a boat could come in with hundreds and thousands of fish, and there could be many boats coming in. And like there is in Alaska, there was recently in Alaska, too many fish. And yet you have hundreds of people all trained and ready to process it. And there's still too much. You can, people can only do so much, right. you know. And there aren't, there, apparently there aren't machines, or, or you can't drag computer-operated machines to the Alaska wilderness and just start them up once a year because then they're going to sit and rust for the next right. 10 months, you know? But so, yeah, 50 yeah. years ago, they didn't yeah. have that technology, yeah. no. so they had to have the yeah. manpower to do and, it. And um, so uh, it took a lot of people just to, to keep the machine running, 500 cans a minute. We'll go, the machine wanted to run 500 cans a minute if you could keep them going, so there could be hundreds of people all feeding that one machine. People upstairs getting cardboard boxes full of cans down, shoving them down en masse, you know. People, then what are we going to do with it? So they come off the end. Now we've got more cardboard boxes full of fish in cans. So now that's got to be stacked somewhere else, you know. 
And, then and, you, and did they have a can uh, fact, can making factory here too, or did no, they did no. they buy the cans and no. have them shipped in? You, we have some cans here. See, this American Can Company. Okay. Those were the guys, and there's the can, there's the can lids just okay. there. Okay. And that so no, the, there was um, they had to be there had to be a mass production. They, they, because once you get going, you're either going to make a million cans or you're going to go broke. You know, right. You've got to, you're, you're going to supply a, a lot of the whole West Coast industry um, with, with your product. That was the kind of product. That was like Henry Ford building cars. You know, you've right. got, got to have quantity coming out there. And, um, and the last thing I was going to say there was that what did they do with those boxes of cans? Well, we had a railway coming in here. Oh, really? Right? That, that second set of pilings that you see right out there is a railway there and i can um we might we should be able to see a picture of that somewhere mm, let's see uh anyway so they'd have a, a railroad car a freight car parked inside the cannery there and they'd be stacking it up with a product they could also put ice in the car and send fresh fish to okay. portland uh if they had if they didn't that's that well they if they had something the restaurants wanted or they could send part can, part fresh, you know. And the, um, so the railway was here before the road was any good. The rat train was the only way to get things done. And um, let me see. I'm wondering if we've got a picture of... Um, oh, maybe I've taken that down there. Hmm. Uh, uh, let's see. We can walk outside. Let's walk okay. outside and I'll point to where the railway came from there. Well, um, I think I saw the pylons yeah, when I came sure. in. Yeah, so you, so I, know, I know what yeah. you're talking about. Pilings, pilings, pilings. And, okay. Um, so these are that we got real, real boats. And then the you've got here. you've got yeah, actual yeah, boats yeah. that were that were used, yeah, and kind yeah. of the evolution of the boats. Yeah, it looks sure. like. Yeah, they're all wooden boats. All now the thing that boats. amazed me when I was watching that yeah. that video yeah. is that these guys used to go out in these. Th these are these are big boats. They're what yeah. thirty foot long. That's right. Yeah. Uh, about five foot wide and about mm -hmm. three and a half feet deep. Mm -hmm. And they would go out with just oars and a sail. Yeah, yeah. And they did that for a lot of years, and then they'd throw their nets out and then uh, bring the fish in and then mm -hmm. be able to come back in. Yeah. But you, that can't be easy to row. And it looked no, like there was yeah. just one set of oars on this thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's true. And um, I, I have my own, I'm a sailor, I have my own suspicion that you didn't really row the boat very far. You, you pointed it in the right direction and hoped the current would take you or, or the wind would blow you without having to set the sails. Because well, something you, else you, I you, saw. Lower the, you lower the sails and the mast, and so you're trying to avoid any extra work. You know, the, but rowing's just hopeless compared to sailing. Just and they would go out sailing. for two and three days at a time? A week at a time. A, a week, week at, at a time. time. Or five, six days at a time. And it doesn't look like there's any real sleeping accommodations no. in these things. No. Where, where in the world did they sleep? They just made a space for themselves there, yeah. And then it looked like they laid the sail down on some of these yeah. to where it kind of covered them up in inclement weather? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Well, I, I, we don't know anymore. I hope so. But there is, there is the possibility that all they had was the sail for the tent cover. And, and, and it was pretty miserable, you know. I was going to say, and, the, um, the, the weather around yeah, here is not yeah, ever yeah. very nice. It I mean, could rain at any point in time. I mean, from our perspective, 100 years later, you can say, oh, well, you get a sail cover and you'd inflatable mattress and a sleeping bag. But those things were foreign. That, that, I mean... Those, those, those ideas didn't exist a hundred years ago. You know, a sleeping yeah. bag was something Eskimos got into, you know. I mean, uh, uh, the, a mattress was something stuffed with hair, you know, uh, or straw. So those don't translate in, into working men on boats. Maybe when the Vanderbilts went yachting off of Newport, right. they, they had that kind of stuff, but, you know, but no. That working, I mean, it was hard here, and it was hard there, and it was, it was hard in the woods, logging... You know, but they only had two logging. guys working oh, each yeah. one of these yeah. boats. Sure, yeah. Which is just phenomenal too. Well, yeah, I mean, pulling pu in the nets. That's, and, the, that's and more the point. They had to pull the net in by hand. You know, today these guys. I mean, this was the first powered. We got the first powered system, which is the hydraulic reel. Um, but that's only. Uh, that's what shall I say? That's barely scratching the surface, because the modern boats also have a powered reel, and that's just to get the the net over the gunnel doesn't really, it kind of steers the net into the boat. But what they have, 
further back in the boat is a reel, a reel that's six feet tall that has a hydraulic motor on it like you wouldn't believe that can, right. that can break the net, can break the net, it can break the boat, the reel. And so they can reel that thing in so fast you can barely see, but you, you've got to pick the fish off, hence the term fish pick. You've got to pick, pick quick or you won't be on that boat for long. So, um, but, but there was, um, not only were they pulling the net in with freezing hands, you know, but they've got to get the fish off and sort them and steer them into the right lockers in the boat. And the life was hard. That's all I can say. And how, and how many feet of net would they put out with this? I don't know. Um, I know the modern net is 1,200 feet long. Uh, which is a good distance. That's like oh, round, yeah. round a, that's like a, you could make a loop like around a running track. If you visualize right. that there. Um, those guys, they put out as much as they hoped they could, uh, but not more than they could pull in. Different days, they may set out just a bit of it. They may set out all of it, uh, depending on, on the day. Uh, but they were tough, weren't they? They were tough, yeah. They had to be tough. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I can't even imagine sitting out there in, in those kind of yeah. conditions. I mean, this boat's a nice boat. It, it probably handled the waves and some of that pretty well. But there is no, I mean, you're out in the weather That's all right. the time. It's, right. it's not any, so, no accommodations whatsoever to get in and out so, of anything. So they did start putting engines in them as soon as they could, and nobody objected to that. They took them out of cars, like, like 1895 automobiles, fine, we'll take that engine. It may not be, we've got a horse, we've got a sail, so it's not going to kill us. And they, they, were, they were converting them. Whereas in other places, they, fishermen were told, oh no, you can't have an engine, that's cheating. You know, we're not going to let you have an engine. And, um, and that's vicious, that's vicious. Yeah. <laughs> and I find that to be, you know, cruel and unusual punishment, actually. <laughs> because in Alaska, they waited, wait for it, 50 years before they let them have a motor. Really? 50 years. There are men alive today who were doing that. Wow. They, they, they forced men after World War II to come back from the war and get into a rowboat and row it to fish. I really? Mean, I mean, when, when, when the whole world, when there were engines for sale, there were surplus boats and engines. When, then there's landing craft, aircraft carriers, everything, motors everywhere. Oh, no, 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 you can't have an engine. Huh. Yeah. Speaking of engines, yeah. you've got several yeah. of the old, yeah. uh, like, yeah. beginnings of yeah. the outboard yeah. motor here. They all look like yeah. they're, what, three or five horsepower? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and um, you've got seven of them. Yeah. They're fun little antiques. I mean, I, I kind of collected them because I like them. Um, uh, fishermen would have used them, um, but not really for, not for commercial fishing. They would have used them for pottering around in, going over to the islands, coming back again, or... Um, let's see what other stuff um, they, they did fishing from sandbanks and other things where they could putter over in a little boat they're, right. they're, but they're just part of the history and, um, and part of the culture here now did and, they take um, these boats uh, like the row boats and with a sail on yeah. and stuff did they take those over the bar or did they just um, mostly stay inside the bays and rivers yeah, around they here? only went over the bar accidentally there in those boats because that's a pretty complicated thing to get back in again, you know. Um, so they were meant to stay in the river. So if they made it over the bar, were they just kind of lost at sea unless well, a big yeah. ship had picked no, them up, well, or well, were they well, able to get back in? Well, well, they had to wait. You know, if they went out on one side, they'd have to wait till the tide came back in again. It was not a good situation on that boat um, uh, because all, all open boats, and that includes today, if, if your boat doesn't have enough buoyancy in it, that it'll fill up with water and sink, then you're in bad shape, aren't you there? But, you know, what do I know? <laughs> we have hundreds of boats like that go out sport fishing every summer. But I like to see a boat that's covered up. You know, right. That's um, divided into compartments. And that's not the traditional way of thinking there. Uh, so, yeah, there are stories of lots of men being lost during s certain storms when the wind blew the wrong way. And, um, and, and they never came home. And uh, so that's, you know, that, that, that was tragedy on a grand scale. I mean, the similar sort of things have happened from other big fishing ports, you know, from Bedford, Massachusetts and stuff like that. Right. Um, but this was, a, this was a place where you were lucky to live out your life as a fisherman. You know, if you, the more you did it, the, 
the, the more chances there were, you wouldn't come home at the end. I mean, but this area, yeah, but this area yeah. is full of jobs yeah, like yeah, that. I mean, sure, you had the yeah, you had the yeah. timber industry, sure. and the timber industry was dangerous yeah, yeah. as all get out. I'm thinking too. of things like there were no flares; they didn't even have a flashlight. You know, so, wow. So well, it wasn't invented, was it? Right. Um, yeah. So if they had a lantern, you probably couldn't light it in a storm. You know, a pa right. kerosene lantern. You'd be imagine trying to wave a kerosene lantern to to attract attention there. You know, um, so no no life jackets. No. no. Wow. No. Um, so, yeah. Very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As dangerous as it gets there. Yeah. And, um, so, yes. Yeah. So, there are, um, that's why we have the Fisherman's Memorial under the big bridge there, you know. Although that's a more modern thing, it, it, it does note a fisherman who died at home can still get on the memorial there, you know. But there's lots to, um, there's been uh, lots of, um, uh, sadness associated with that, you know. And even today, as I said, crab fishing, um, people rush out to try and grab their share and get it back in time for Christmas. And if you if you, and you start rushing the bar, um, there there was a let me see there was an accident uh, earlier this year uh, down at Florence, and they rammed the bar, they rammed the the jetty, and that has happened. Every other year since I've been here, someone has rammed the jetty in the dark, and it's like, well, what, did you fall asleep? You know, were you paying attention? If you, why don't you go down the middle of the channel? Um, but yeah, you ram the jetty. Clearly, it's not your day. You no. Know, yeah. uh, the last that one was very sad. A, pr a previous one, I think last year's one, was they rammed the jetty and they were seen banging against the jetty upside down, and they got the fire and rescue team down got a rope on it so it didn't disappear, and so they carried down a portable chainsaw, well, not a chainsaw, a portable gas-powered skill saw, right. and cut a hole in the side of the boat. It was a wooden boat, I think, could have been fiberglass, and the guys, the guys climbed down through the hole. There was like three or four guys inside. Really? So they got lucky? They got lucky, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so we've got a big Coast Guard presence here <clears throat> when you're here you're very likely to see a Coast Guard helicopter flying over. Um, probably doing training, not always, not often rescue, but they're training a lot. And they also train other Coast Guardsmen. In fact, we described the bar. Well, guess what? The Coast Guard has a training school. It's across the river in Washington. And uh, Coast Guardsmen come from, and women come from all over the nation, you know, from Florida to Maine to California. They come here to get the shit kicked out of them on the bar. <laughs> Because wow. they, and they know that at three o'clock this afternoon, you're going out. When we, when we tell everybody else not to be on the bar, that's when you're going out. Because you might have to rescue someone who ignored the warning, right? And they go out with the, with the breaking waves and they get the boats are capable of, of the boats are self-writing for the very good reason that they often get rolled over. That's a 40, 47 foot boat there. Yeah. And it's just a toy. That's just amazing to think that, that yeah. it could roll a 40-foot yeah. yeah. boat. Yeah. And um, so if you roll it, by the way, um, it, you can limp back, but you will have destroyed all the antenna, the radios will be soaking wet. You know, you can't have waterproof radios. Right. Really. Radar will be mashed up. So that boat's out of action for several weeks. You know? Wow. But that's the cost of training. And when you, when you get your, um, your surf man... Um, uh, um, certification as a coxswain, you're a surf man on a rescue boat, that means you can go back to Maine, Florida, or wherever, and you know that you can handle it because you have been on the bar, you know, and you've uh, you won your spurs on the bar there, yeah. And um, uh, incidentally, when you go across there, that's high land. We don't have any high, we have the Esther Column here, which is very nice, <coughs> it's 600 feet high. Um, oh, well, that is higher. But uh, on, the, on the Washington side, you go much closer to the sea, actually on the outer coast where, where there's a lighthouse, where the Coast Guard has a watch station, and you can look down on this amazing bar, and um, you, that's as close as you can get to it from that cliff over there. And there's some nice uh, scenery over there and parks and trails. So we are, we are sort of 10 miles from um, the ocean here. Okay. Right. Um, so, and... and um, and it's just sandy and flat beyond here. Um, 
for the next 10 miles. And most of that land wasn't there originally. Most of that land was created by the jetty changing the flow, the, the onshore flow of sand. And so the Oregon grew and grew and grew. It grew by a mile or two. And now you can, they got the, they got this, the, I think it's America's biggest campground is, is on the northwest tip. And it's all on, used to be underwater. Wow. It's just, and that's all from the, if you took the jetty away, nature would, re, would, re, would, what, would retake that land, would turn it into water again there. And you can see that happening on the Washington side now, actively happening. The sand's coming and going quite often. Okay. There. Yeah, so um, Mother Nature is still really ruling the show out there, you know. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So, is this, we're, we're, we're through with our tour yeah. of the museum. Yeah. Okay. Do you guys have a website where yeah. people can see some pictures or, sure. or contact great, you if they want to? Not a great to? website. And, um, um, yes, uh, what's it called? Cannery Worker, canneryworker.org. Canneryworker.org. But I'm not heavily into the virtual uh, computer um, presence for this. This is what it is. And you've got to come and you've got to see it. You and, do, and, and, and this is this is this is kind of a hidden gem. Yeah. I I've been to Astoria several times, but as I was coming in, I went. Yeah. Yeah. There's a cannery museum here. Yeah. It's at Pier 39, which would be 39th Street. Sure. Is that correct? It's kind of the last street in port in, in Astoria, in Astoria going east there. The okay. Last main street. You know, and it's well marked on the highway. Yeah. It's yeah. easy to find. Yeah. You come on down. There's parking yeah. if you can't bring it on across yeah. the. The pier. I've got I've got a rather large yeah. vehicle, so I wasn't able to bring it across right. the pier. And, and uh, you can park on the other side, walk across. But there is parking over here. There's limited parking over here, and, and lots of people have to turn around because they, <laughs> there wasn't room for them. But yeah. they've also got a dive shop here, yeah. a scuba diving yeah. shop. They've got a restaurant. Yeah, got a they've... canvas canvas making shop, canvas bags, canvas repair. And we've got the rogue ales and. Um, We've got the, so the, it's that combination of, of business, by the way, and the coffee shop on the waterfront, the coffee girl. Right. It's that combination which makes the owner enough money to keep this thing afloat because you, if you don't maintain a pier, it'll fall apart right under your feet. It'll, if I can show you through that doorway there, I'm not allowed to take you through there. It's falling into the sea back there. Wow. And we're, we're standing on tree trunks, tree trunks, everywhere. Right. called pilings. And they weren't creosoted, that, that wasn't allowed then. I don't think it'd been invented. And, um, and it's tied together with big planks, with big bolts and big nails and big guys who know how to do that stuff. And if we walk out here, we can see the project they're working on here. Now, we can, now we can walk on yeah, out yeah, after, we as we out. walk out to the yeah, edge of the yeah. pier, we see out into the Columbia River where there's a couple of really nice yeah. big ships and and that behold, are sitting the, out here. The sky's turning pink because we've got a sunset going. And, and it's, a, uh, it's a beautiful sunset tonight. Yeah. And, um, and that's, you can see here, um, well, if you get out to the front and look back around the angle, you can see what holds the, pipe, the pier up. Oh, yeah. Hundred, yeah, you can see all the... Hundred-year-old trees with moss growing on them, you know, there. Yeah. And that's... Um, and we're above the water by what, probably 30 feet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can hear the that probably changes as the tide comes that, in and goes that's out. Right. And, that's right there. And some of that. And I can see uh, the tides going out that way there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so people come out here at six in the morning to buy their coffee and sit by the river and, um, and enjoy, enjoy um, not going on the water. <laughs> Not many people in that story have any interest at all in, in any of this anymore, and then um, any sort of boating. I mean, guys come from all over to catch fish, but um, the local men, they don't sport, they don't fish for sport, they fish for a living, you know. And right. They, and they fish in Alaska, where there's plenty of fish left there. There's no, there's no, there's no living to be made with fish on the Columbia. And you got a beautiful yeah. view of the yeah. big bridge and... Yeah. Sure. and Anyway, I really yeah. appreciate yeah. your time, Peter. I appreciate you coming down here and meeting with us and taking us through your museum, talking to us about some of the history of the cannery and, and just fishing in general. And, uh, you know, the world is full of wonder. 
People need to get out and explore, yeah. Yeah. see what's out here. And I hope that everybody has an absolutely wonder-filled day. Haul the roll and go, where am I to go? Meet Johnny, where am I to go? For I'm a young and a sailor lad, and where am I to go?